Hello, we're back with more in Cape Physics. We'll be continuing our journey today looking at the PN junction diode. I'm Paul Bender. Okay, when we, when we speak about junction diodes, uh, they are such a very important part of many of the electronic devices that we use and so on, all right? And associated with any junction di diode are some terms that we will explore and we will also explore how the junction diode functions and then we look at a couple of uses for the junction diode. All right, so at the end of this presentation, you should be able to distinguish between a semiconductor and a conductor. You're supposed to be ex able to explain the terms intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors. You ought, to, um, you ought to be able to explain the formation of what is called a depletion layer at a PN junction. I'm losing it. Ex um, use the terms reverse bias and forward bias. Interpret the IV graph of a PN junction diode. Those are what we'll be able to, and also explain the role of a PN junction diode in AC rectification. That's one of the uses. Might seem like a bit much, but we'll, we'll be able to get through it today. All right, so first of all, we want to semiconductor. The word semi suggests half, half conductor, or semi suggests part conductor. So when we talk of a semiconductor, we're, not, we're talking of a material that is not um, a full conductor, and it has some properties that differ from conducting materials. So let's look at some of these, these differences here. We have a conductor and a semiconductor. Conductor has a, has a, conductors have a large number of free electrons, which wherein semiconductors have a low number of free electrons. Conductors generally are metals, and metals have a, a, a lattice structure in which there are free electrons or a sea of electrons which are available for conduction, whereas semiconductors tend to come from group four or the metalloids within the the, the periodic table as classification of materials and as such they have what are called covalent bonds and so with covalent bonds the valence electrons are not really free they are all bound up in bonding with other atoms forming the bonds between atoms so the electrons are not really free whereas in a metal there is there are this lattice structure with a sea of electrons that are around the atoms, and these sea of electrons can be easily detached, right? The outer electrons of atoms in conductors can be removed with small potential difference. You apply a small potential difference, and the, the, these electrons can be removed. Outer electrons have to be removed with a relatively large potential difference in semiconductors. And so, when... Uh, because of that covalent bond and the strong bonds that they are formed. Materials, conductors are normally materials with low resistivity. The resistivity is a factor that tells you how resistant this material is to the flow of current through it. If a material has a low resistivity, it allows current to flow through it readily. If it has a high resistivity, it it doesn't allow current to flow through it. Insulators have extremely high resistivities. They just don't allow current to flow through them. However, semiconductors have resistivities somewhere between a, a, a conductor and an insulator. So they have um, their resistivities. In conductors will not behave as an insulator at any temperature. No matter what temperature you put a semi a insul, a conductor, it does not change its conducting properties. 
what happens is when you carry a conductor to near the absolute zero, then it becomes a superconductor and it has zero resistance, right? Um, pure semiconductors behave as insulators as at the absolute zero of temperature. So the reverse happens. If you carry a semiconductor to a temperature near the absolute zero of temperature, it will behave as an insulator. So this is a critical difference between conductors and, and insulators here. Now, if you mix conductors with impurities, it causes an increase in the resistivity. So conductors, if you put impurities, if, for instance, you have a pure, a pure material, say aluminum, and you put another metal and you make a, a, a um, and you make a, a, a alloy, that all alloy will not have the same con resistivity. It will have a higher resistivity than the pure aluminum itself. However, on the other side, mixing semiconductors with impurities can cause a decrease in the resistivity. That means that the semiconductor will become more conducting and become a better conductor. And this property of semiconductors we will look at that is used in, deter in making semiconductors a little bit more conduct um, conducting so that you can use them for all the processes that you can use them for. Some examples of, of conductors, silver, copper, aluminum are conductors. And um, some examples of semiconductors, sili silicon, germanium, and gallium. These are found in in the group four of the periodic table. For those of you who are familiar with the periodic table in group four, and they all belong to the classification of materials called metalloids. And so they are, that's where they are found. That is in the same group with carbon. And so they are, they are tetravalent. They have four outer electrons. Group four, remember in the groups, it tells you how many electrons, how many valence electrons they are, and in the period, it tells you how many orbits. But in, so all of these are group four elements. Okay. We look at what are called intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors. Those are just terms. Remember, we said that if you if you have a pure a pure semiconductor, say silicon, without any impurities. Without any impurities, we call that an intrinsic semiconductor. So this, an intrinsic semiconductor, they have one type of atom throughout. If you were to go to any part of an intrinsic, sem a sample of in intrinsic semiconductor, you will find the same atoms. However, if you put impurities, and we will see that the impurities is not like just pouring dirty something on something. It is about adding atoms that are not the same as the intrinsic. If you put atoms which are of a different element, we call those impurities. And so extrinsic semi semiconductors have impurities within them. And so we will look at how, how extrinsic semiconductors are formed from intrinsic semiconductors. And remember, Bear in mind that what it said is that if you put impurities in semiconductor materials, you decrease, you decrease the resistivity, and as such, these semiconductors will become more conducting. They'll be able to be, become better conductors. And so the whole, the whole process of putting impurities into intrinsic semiconductors, a, a method called doping, is a very, very important part of all of the whole electronics enterprise as um, there are, they are hundreds of companies and so on that are just dedicated to doing this, this kind of, of thing. All right. All right. So here we have an N-type intrinsic semiconductor. This is silicon. This is silicon. And silicon has this kind of a square lattice structure. 
quite different from carbon, which has a tetrahedral structure. It is cubical in nature, but this is just one dimension. And these are the, the valence electrons. Each silicon has four valence electrons. But you remember in, the out, in that shell, in that outermost shell, it can accommodate up to eight electrons. And so they form the covalent bonds. And so they, when they share the electrons, each one completes the shell with its eight electrons. And so we have that kind of a lattice structure. And so this is an intrinsic, intrinsic, semiconductor as it is, because it has one type of atom. Now, if we were to take, say, if we were to take phosphorus, phosphorus is a group, five element. Phosphorus will have five valence electrons, five valence electrons. And if we were to take that phosphorus and we were to replace a silicon atom with that phosphorus atom, then this is what will happen. So we're going to replace this silicon with the phosphorus. We're going to replace this silicon with the phosphorus. What happens is that, the, it, remember this is, this is pentavalent. It has five orbital electrons. And so four of those electrons will form bonds with four of the silicons around it, and there will be an uh, an unattached electron, all right? So these four here, they would form the bonds, and then we have an unattached electron here. These ones are unattached. And those electrons become available for conduction. So what we have done, we have made this intrinsic semiconductor, an extrinsic semiconductor with two available or, well, at least in this particular thing, with available electrons which become available for conduction. And if you have more electrons available for conduction, you have reduced the resistivity of the material. And so we call this an n-type because we have two negative particles that are available, n-negative type extrinsic semiconductor. All right, so if you take a one from a group high up, we use phosphorus. All right. Then we can look at p-type. Again, we have our intrinsic. And then we, if we take an aluminum, say an aluminum atom, aluminum comes from the group three. So this is trivalent, and it has three valence electrons. Now, if you were to replace a silicon with that aluminum, if you were to replace the silicon with the aluminum, we replace these two with an aluminum. These three will form bonds with the, with the thing, but then it only has three. Then we will have two vacant spaces or two vacant states, right? Two vacant states here, which in the theory we call them holes. We call them holes because these are vacant. There are no electrons there are no electrons in, that, in those, those two states there, all right? They are, they are called holes. Okay, let me just make sure that I have. I don't want the... All right, so these holes here and these other electrons have formed the bonds. And so we have holes. Now, those are just vacant states. And they are considered to be positive electrons, or they're considered to be positive electrons. And so here we have our p-type, positive type extrinsic semiconductor. Now these positive electrons are also available for conduction. Now there's a theory they call the energy gap theory and so on. We wouldn't get into that, but it, that, this is also explained in terms of energy gap theory. But suffice it to say that when you do n-type doping, they call it doping, or when you make an intrinsic semiconductor into an extrinsic semiconductor by using um, n-type doping, you, you get available electrons. When you use p-type doping, you get available positive electrons, otherwise called holes, all right, or vice versa. So this, this is your p-type.
So now, what is this thing about a PN junction? A PN junction suggests bringing P-type and N-type materials together at, a, at some junction. So let's see what a PN junction is. A PN junction is an interface or boundary between two semiconductor material types, namely the P-type and the N-type inside a semiconductor. Now, in theory, what we do, we just bring two, two pieces of um, P-type and N-type. And theoretically, we say how, what would happen. But when this is done practically, you have one piece of semiconductor material, and it, they are selectively doped together. And so what, hap what happens when you bring these two materials together? So let's see. So we look at the depletion layer, and this is where the theory of the depletion layer comes into being. Now we have two, a P-type. This is a P-type material. This is an N-type. The N-type, the P-type is the holes. N-type is the electrons. All right? So we, so we bring these two together. Now when we bring these two materials together, you remember there are negative elect there are, these are electrons that are available for conduction, and these are holes waiting to be filled because they are vacant spaces. And if there are electrons around, the electrons will go and fill those spaces. And so what begins to happen? When, that, when, this, when, when this happens, then we have our P and our N there. What begins to happen is that electrons begin to go across. They begin to go across. But when they leave their places, they leave holes where they are, right? And once these electrons go across, what becomes here? Here becomes positively charged, and here becomes negatively charged, close to the junction. And once we have positive and negative charges, then an electric field develops. Because we have positive charge and negative charge, an electric field develops across the junction. As this process continues, the electric field grows. And so the electric field grows. And as the electric field grows, you will, see, you will see that this electric field will start to prevent electrons from going across the barrier, the junction. Because the electric field will repel the electrons this way. And it will also prevent the holes from going across the barrier because the electric field wants to propel the holes back that way. So after a while, the electric field becomes strong enough to stop the movement or the diffusion of electrons and holes across the junction. And that layer now remains that way. And so what we get is what is called a depletion layer. If you notice the amount of electrons, the electron density outside of the depletion layer and the whole density outside of the depletion layer is greater than in the depletion layer. Okay, so in the depletion layer, we have a, a, a sparser whole and electron density than we have on the outside. And that is why they use the word depletion. The amount of electrons and holes within that layer are depleted. They are lessened, all right? And so this electric field it is what it is that keeps these electrons. What happens, right, in actual fact, is that some of these electrons are still able to go against the field and they, 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 they diffuse across the, as well, right? They drift across, all right? But they are very small amount. And so what happens when there is a stability, there is a continuous diffusion and drift that is happening, okay? All right, and so that is our depletion layer. So the depletion layer is this layer that comes about when you bring the P and N junctions together, and when you bring them together, because the electrons are going to fill the holes, they diffuse across the junction, and the hole, when they leave their position, they leave a hole. So after a while, we get holes accumulating on the N side, and electrons accumulating on the P side close to the junction, but after a while that flow, that diffusion stops because of an electric field 
which continuously builds up there. Okay, so that is, that is our depletion layer. Now, we use these PN junctions, and we call them PN junction diodes. You make diodes out of these PN junctions. We use them in electronic circuits. Okay, and so we want to look at the theory on how they function in electronic circuits. And so we can do two types of biases. We, do, we call it biasing the electronic, the, the, PN, the junction diode. And biasing is just put a, putting a voltage across it, a potential difference across the diode. Um, but, you know, the, we call it biasing. And so we can forward bias and we can reverse bias. So we will start with reverse bias. How are we going to reverse bias a PN junction? So we already have an internal electric field, as we saw, right? This electric field is existing. Now, if in a reverse bias, what we do, we apply a potential difference, a positive end of the potential difference to the N side, and the negative to the P side. And when that happens, there is an external electric field, right? An external electric field appears because once we have a potential difference out there, we will have an electric field. So an external electric field applies. But if you notice, these two electric fields, which are vector quantities, are in the same direction. And so what happens is that we get a large electric field. And this large electric field causes more diffusion to take place until such time that, again, the electric field becomes strong enough to stop the diffusion once again. Okay, and so that large electric field will cause the depletion layer to widen. And so what happens? Nothing flows. If you increase the potential difference, all you do is to increase the depletion layer and it prevents currents from flowing. So when a, when a diode is in reverse bias, it does not allow current to flow through it. But whereas if we have in a forward bias, in a forward bias, we add a positive to this side and a negative to the N side, we attach a negative pole to the N side and a positive pole to the P side. That will send an external field this way. These are vectors. When we add them, the resultant field, the resultant field, these, the resultant of these two fields will cause the depletion layer to disappear because, and then we will have a field that will be able to drive these electrons across from the, the end side. And so what happens is that these electrons are driven and what we see is that as the electrons drive and come out this side, the holes tend to be drifting towards this side as the electrons leave here. So we have a drift of electrons this way, and we have a drift of holes that way. All right? And so within the junction, within the, the diode, the current that flows is as a result of the movement of both holes and electrons, different from a conductor in which only electrons move within conductors. In semiconductors, and this is an essential difference as well, in semiconductors, the, the current consists of movement of both holes and electrons. Are, are, Right, both positive and negative electrons. And so that's, that's what, that is what happens. So if we can just recap this briefly. So when we, when we have our external field, the sum of those two fields causes the depletion layer to disappear. And when the defle depletion layer disappears, and the, everything begins to drift down. As these electrons drift down, the holes tend to seem to be drifting backwards. So the holes are going this way, and electrons are going that way, and they complete a circuit and keep coming around like that. All right? So, okay. Now, what is, what is going to happen here? Now, 
what would happen if the external field is less? The potential difference that is producing that external electric field causes an external electric field which is less than the internal electric field. That would be represented by a shorter arrow. What will happen? What will happen? Nothing will happen because there will still be a resultant internal field which will stop the flow of current. So there is a, a particular potential difference below which a PN junction diode will not be conducting. And if that potential difference does not cause an external field that is greater than the internal field, then there will be no conduction. So that there is a kind of a, they call it a cut-in, a cut-in voltage. This voltage is, is a voltage, a minimal voltage that is required to make the PN junction diode function, to make it function. It will, not, it will not allow a current to flow in the reverse bias, but it would not allow a current to flow in the forward bias either if the voltage is less than the cut-in voltage. And if the vol because if the voltage is less than the cut-in voltage, the external field is smaller than the internal field and the voltage will not be able to overcome what is called that potential barrier. You will not, so you, when you sum the two fields, you will still get a resultant field going this way, which will prevent the, the, the junction diode from conducting. And so this graph here is the um, IV characteristics of a junction diode. I hope you can see it clearly. This is in the forward bias in the conduction. And if you notice, in this part here, from here to here, there is no, cur no current is flowing. Current is zero. At some point, probably ar around point 0.5, because for silicon, and this is a typical silicon, silicon, the cut-in voltage is about 0.5 volts. If you have anything less than 0.5 volts for a silicon PN junction diode, it's just not going to function whether in forward or reverse bias, okay? And so the cutting voltage is about 0.5 volts, okay? And then after that 0.5 volts, this is what they, it begins to conduct. And here, in the reverse bias, you can go back as far, very, very far back. And what happens is when you Im keep Im increasing the voltage, just like insulators, after a while, the semiconductor, it will break down. It will lose its, that resistive property. Its, its resistivity will just become zero. Same thing happens to insulators. When you have insulators and you apply a high enough current, even air, which is a good insulator, dry air, if you apply a high enough current, the air breaks down, and that is why you see sparks jumping between um, high voltage to high voltage terminals because the air loses its insulating properties and it is able to conduct those sparks. And so if you carry this far enough, this will begin to conduct a current. And if you know it, it is a, it's dramatic, right? So this is in the forward bias, reverse bias, cutting, cutting, temp, cutting voltage. Okay. Let's look at two discussion questions before we, we close. N-type extrinsic semiconductors have one unattached electron per atom. So the question is, how is it that a sample of N times N-type semiconductor is not negatively charged? We saw that four of the, four of the phosphorus electrons will form covalent bonds with four of the, uh, of the surrounding silicon electrons, valence electrons, and there is one electron free. So that means that there's one electron free. And so how come it is that if you take a sample of N-type semiconductor material, it is not negatively charged? We saw that there is one. Now here is the reason. <clears throat> 
you take a neutral phosphorus atoms which have the amount of protons in the nucleus to elect elect electrically balance the number of electrons in the nucleus. So that extra electron, extra in inverted commas, that is out there, it's not an electron without a balancing proton because that electron is associated with the phosphorus atoms which have the, elect the number of electrons to balance how many of the electrons it has. Okay, and so that one electron is, doesn't contribute to the negativity of, the, of the, um, the, the, the sample. That one electron is balanced out by a proton in the nucleus of the phosphorus atom. So, and the same thing for the p-type. The p-type would not be positive because there, there, is, there are no, no protons there are no more protons for that vacant space, just the same am amount of protons because it's neutral atoms you are using to, to use the doping. And then this is another question. A PN junction allows current to flow in one direction only. What will occur when a PN junction diode is placed in a circuit with a lamp and an AC source? So if quickly... If we have a lamp and we have a junction diode here, that's a symbol for a junction diode, and we have an AC source. Remember what we said in the last, in the last lesson, that an AC current changes direction periodically. So for one period of time, it's going this way, and so the, the diode will be conducting when it's going this way, the lamp will light. When the current reverses, remember the diode will be now in reverse bias, there will be no current, the lamp will go out. And so the lamp will light, go out, light, go out. And so we can, uh, as the current changes direction, the lamp will light and go out because the diode will go from forward bias to reverse bias as the current changes direction. 